Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started as people are coming in. Uh, welcome to the Housing and Services Resource Center's webinar titled Working Together to Empower Community Inclusion, Healthy Housing and Independent Living Partnerships. We're going to be learning a lot from the presenters today in a short amount of time. We've also built in a variety of opportunities for you to be active participants too. So we really appreciate you joining us today. Next slide. So my name is Erin McFadden and I'm the Director of the Office of Independent Living Programs at the Administration on Disabilities, which is part of the Administration for Community Living. So I'm going to be serving as the facilitator for today's webinar, and it really is a privilege to have so many of you here with us today. When we saw the registration list, we were really excited. Your active involvement in this webinar is going to be essential for us to have an engaging and enriching discussion. Next slide. There's a few housekeeping items that we want to address first. Um, first of all, the meeting is being recorded. So by staying to participate, you are consenting to the recording. Also, just know all the attendees have been muted for audio quality. One hallmark of our webinars is active participation from attendees. So please, please frequently use the chat to make comments and submit your questions at any time in the Q&A feature in the Zoom dashboard. You can also email a question or comment to hsrc at acl.hhs.gov. We did reserve time to address your questions at the end as well. You can use the chat or email if you have a technical issue or comment for other attendees. Next slide. So before we start with the presentations, I'd like to tell you about the Housing and Services Resource Center, or what we call here a HSRC. It stems from a new partnership between the Administration for Community Living and other Department of Health and Human Service agencies, along with the Department of HUD. Every state and community has a number of entities and programs helping people access housing and supportive services. But the housing and services systems, as we all know, are often siloed. Stronger collaboration between these systems would help more people with disabilities, older adults, and people experiencing homelessness to achieve housing stability, live with dignity and independence in the community, and avoid homelessness and costly institutional care. So people with disabilities and older adults can stay stably housed, healthy, and active in their communities. The HSRC provides technical assistance across the federal agencies to cultivate cross-sector partnerships that bring together housing, homelessness services, aging disability services, health, including physical, behavioral, and mental health, and public health in an effort to address tackling these silos. So after the webinar, I hope you'll look at the HSRC website at acl.gov backslash housing and services. Um, it's on this slide. Um, and at the end, we'll share an email address so you can also be in touch with us and get periodic updates. That's what we're up to. Next slide. So the HSRC serves many sectors, each with its own unique terms, policies, and practices. In this webinar, we're going to be approaching community inclusion from the ADA, or the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now, this far-reaching piece of civil rights legislation makes clear that people with all types of disabilities have the same rights as people without disabilities to live, work, and participate in their communities. Yet far too many people who can and want to live in the community remain in institutions because there's not that many options. That's why a critical focus for us at ACL is helping people with disabilities of all ages move out of nursing homes and other institutions and avoid entering them in the first place. So today I ask that we all focus on a single goal, which is community integration. We're going to feature partnerships and strategies that have been developed, particularly for people with mental illness but which are broadly applicable to all other types of disabilities. Next slide. 
Now, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, our first presenter. Um, the, uh, it, you know, both of them are national expert presenters that are coming up next. And uh, we're going to be sending out their bios uh, tomorrow or after this webinar, so you'll have an idea of their expertise. The first one is Kimberly Reynolds. Kimberly Reynolds, <laughs> she's a public health advisor and government project officer with the Center for Mental Health Services, Substance Abuse, and Mental Health Services Administration. And then next is Marty Neasley uh, with Emeritus uh, TAC. So first, Kim, why don't you go ahead and kick us off, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kim Reynolds and I work for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration or SAMHSA um, in the Center for Mental Health Services in the, in the Division of State and Community Systems Development. So SAMHSA is the agency within the US Department of Health and Human Services that leads public health efforts to advance the behavioral health of the nation and to improve the lives of individuals living with mental and substance use disorders and their families. It is a privilege to be invited to speak with you today about the topic of community inclusion for people with disabilities, including those with behavioral health conditions. The concept of community living is a central tenet of SAMHSA's vision and mission and is inherent in how we define recovery from behavioral health conditions. So we believe that all people can recover from mental illness and substance use disorders and that recovery is a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live self-directed lives and strive to reach their full potential. The four major dimensions of recovery that guide us include, first of all, health, overcoming and managing symptoms and making informed and healthy choices. Uh, second, home, having a safe and stable place to live. And I would add that in the most inclusive setting of a person's choice. Third, purpose, conducting meaningful daily activities such as employment, a school or other opportunities to participate in society, and fourth, community, having relationships and social networks that provide support, friendship, love, and hope. And so SAMHSA re resources support recovery in many ways, um, and, I, and I will talk about a couple of examples today. So first of all, through the protection and advocacy for individuals with mental illness or PAMI program, we provide formula grants to protection and advocacy programs in all states, as well as DC five territories and the American Indian Consortium for Native Americans. PAMI programs protect and advocate for the rights of those with serious mental illness or serious emotional disturbance residing in public and private facilities and community settings who are at risk for abuse, neglect and rights violations by using administrative, legal, systemic or other appropriate remedies on their behalf. They also investigate reports of abuse, including the inappropriate use of seclusion and restraint. And they ensure enforcement of the US Constitution, federal laws and regulations, as well as state statutes. Um, as you may know, the state of Georgia's PAMI program was instrumental in bringing the Olmstead versus LC case to the Supreme Court. So we also provide formula grants to states, territories, and tribes that enable them the flexibility to meet their unique community-based mental health and substance use prevention, treatment, and recovery needs. Uh, we provide funding to behavioral health providers for certified community behavioral health clinics or CCBHCs. Uh, this model is designed to ensure access to comprehensive behavioral health care and to assist individuals in not only navigating and coordinating their behavioral health services, but also their physical health care, social services, and other systems that they're involved in. And CCBHCs are required to serve anyone who requests care for mental health or substance use, regardless of their ability to pay. Also through a variety of mechanisms, we provide funding and other resources to support states, territories, tribes, and behavioral health providers to develop comprehensive crisis systems designed to support individuals in their homes and communities during times when they might otherwise end up in more restrictive settings. We provide funding, technical assistance, and other resources related to housing and homelessness, including five grant programs, the PATH or Projects for Assistance and Transition from Homeless Program, treatments for individuals experiencing homelessness, 
cooperative agreements to benefit homeless individuals, grants for the benefit of homeless individuals, and our SSI, SSDI, Outreach, Access, and Recovery, or SOAR program. We also provide technical assistance and training through our National Homeless and Housing Resource Center. In addition, within SAMHSA, we have an internal housing stability work group um, that is focused on infusing housing stability as a key component and consideration across all SAMHSA programs, given how foundational housing is to recovery and overall health. And then finally, we partner with a number of federal agencies and national nonprofits on related initiatives, including our recent work with the Administration for Community Living on two new resources to address competitive integrated employment for individuals with disabilities, including those with behavioral health conditions. And now I'll turn it over to our next speaker, Marty Nisley. Thanks, Kim. Um, I'm just going to briefly reiterate what uh, Kim uh, just mentioned to you about what is community inclusion? Why are we here today? It's really the opportunity for a person to live in the community of their choice as a contributing member of the community, being valued for their abilities and uniqueness, regardless of disability, and at the same level as a non-disabled person. We each play a role. Um, in helping individuals uh, become more in included in their community by building partnerships to support a person to create their life and be part of the community and to create housing opportunities that also make a house a home. Next slide. Why does this matter? As um, Justice Ginsburg wrote in the Olmstead decision, Segregating people with disabilities really severely diminishes their everyday life, um, including their family, social contacts, um, all that you see here on the screen, uh, educational advancement, cultural enrichment. Um, clearly, institutions segregate people, but without support for those everyday life activities that I just mentioned, segregation can also continue in the community. And we're here today to talk about how to prevent that from happening. And I believe I'm turning it back to Eric. Yes, thank you, Marty. And thank you, Kim, for that great information. Uh, and now we have time to turn it over to our powerhouse panel. Uh, they're going to be sharing information today about some best practices, potential partnerships, um, uh, things that they're doing to promote community integration. And so first, we'll start off with introducing Vicki Smith. She is the executive director of the Alliance of Disability Advocates, which is a center for independent living in North Carolina. We're also going to have Anne Oshel. She's a senior vice president uh, community health and well-being for Alliance Health Plan. And while both organizations have Alliance in their names, just know that they're two totally separate, distinct organizations, okay? <laughs> Uh, but they, we all work together in that space. Marty is also going to be on our panel, and she's been working with both Vicki and Anne, and she's going, we're going to be speaking with all of them about their approach that they're using, their funding they're using, partnerships, and more. And then after they're done sharing their wisdom, we're going to turn it over to you all and hear what your questions are for uh, the panelists. Um, Kim is also going to be staying on, um, and you can be sure to post your questions too um, in the Q&A feature. So with that said, uh, we're going to be turning it on to the panel discussion and we're going to turn it to Marty first. Marty, what is the model of community integration or inclusion that you've been using to guide the process of transitioning individuals? Thanks, Erica. Let me set the context for the model in North Carolina first. Um, I'm the independent reviewer advising the state um, on meeting the terms of their Olmstead agreement between the U.S. Department of Justice and the state of North Carolina. This agreement requires the state to offer and provide services and housing to individuals with disabilities in the most integrated setting possible. The agreement followed a, a DOJ investigation that found that individuals with serious mental illness 
and with other uh, disabilities and health conditions were given few if any choices to live in the community. Instead, individuals were um, directed to move to and remain in congregate settings, primarily adult care homes. Um, and over time, this became the de facto placement option for thousands of individuals with serious mental illness. So the state began implementing this agreement with a required transition process and providing more supported housing and supported employment and services, including tenancy support. But the state knew the support to, to help people move and remain in the community would not by itself be all the help that an individual needed to live a full life in the community. So we sought opportunities to assist individuals to make connections, recognizing and pursuing their uh, interests in life. Luckily, the NCADA um, was also interested in assisting individuals for the same purpose and reached out with an idea for a community inclusion project. They knew they would need a partner organization, one that could help them make introductions to individuals and adopt the model. Um, the Alliance for Behavioral Health was res responsible locally for transitions, services, supported housing, and supports. R but they also recognized the need for a partnership with the NCADA. So the state took the chance by providing seed money for the project. But make no mistake, both the alliance, both the alliances also have quite a bit of sweat equity in this project. They both knew they would need a partner, and it could not come through that supports could not come through the formal system alone. The data of their for their success has borne this out. The partner, these two partner organizations shaped the model themselves began testing it out one person at a time. It works, and now the state is wanting to take this approach statewide. So Erica, back to you. That is a fantastic model, and we appreciate you sharing that today. Um, and, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Anne to share, and how you all at the Alliance of Health Plan, what your role has been in supporting transitions to the community for people with disabilities. Yes, thank you. It's nice to be here today and, and thank you so much for your visionary work and imagining this kind of conversation. Because um, I think this is exactly the kind of conversation that we need to be having nationally. Um, and as I, even as people were putting uh, their, their names and where they're from in the chats, you know, I saw Oregon and Seattle and LA and Philly. I mean, those are all places we have been carefully watching ourselves you know, over the last few years for some of the innovative work that they've done around 1115 waivers and especially states have also been under a similar settlement as North Carolina. So we all learn from each other. Um, and I think from, you know, from it, it's going to be a little weird to hear from two alliances that really have, you know, are separate and apart. But, um, but for Alliance as a health plan, we believed before before we figured out the operational managed care logistics that housing is healthcare. Um, and when you think about coupling housing and healthcare, you know, we we naively at the time, this was more than 10 years ago, thought, well, you know, we, we are obligated under managed care functions. So what does it look like to have a benefit package that covers community living and community inclusion and supportive services? What does it look like to, to, be, to have medical necessity for these services when often their needs of tenancy um, out, you know, are, are longer than sometimes their symptoms of whether or not they're in the hospital or, or such. And so we've spent years trying to figure out just from an operational managed care, how do you pay for it? What does it look like? Um, and then finally, the question that we should all get to, and is it making a positive difference for people? Um, and we could speak the rest of the time of the iterations of learning um, that that took. 
because uh, you know we are very comfortable in our zone of, of what are the typical Medicaid services, what are the services for people that um, that have no insurance. North Carolina is not a Medicaid expansion state, um, so a lot of the work that that Vicky and and Alliance and others have done together, we don't want to create. Um, a dichotomy of a system between those that have Medicaid and those that do not. Um, and, you know, and so for us, it really, it was the realization several years ago that said, you know, healthcare is not one, healthcare doesn't happen just within the four walls. Healthcare happens in the community and healthcare is not, you know, the outcomes of health are not always related to what service they receive. It is about their satisfaction of life, their inclusion in life. And, um, and Erica, some of the things that you just described about community inclusion um, was exactly the impetus for why we have persevered and stayed determined if looking at whole person care from a managed care perspective Perspective. It really is about kind of honoring um, the life that people want for themselves. Incumbent upon us to have that to money follow that person and follow um, what it looks like in community living, um, and to have full and equitable participation in their communities. And so, from a health plan perspective and managed care perspective, it really we we are perfectly positioned um, to make all of that work and come together. Um, in terms of how people receive services and how people experience services. And I think with, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was gonna say that, that's great, Anne. And I was gonna ask for all the centers for independent living that are participating today, what made your health plan decide to partner with the Center for Independent Living Alliance for Disability Advocates, making that vision a reality? Um, well, so I could answer that in a single word, Vicki, um, you know, and, um, and that, um, you know, and I, so for us, it really, I, it was along this realization, this path of, of what does it take, um, and, and hearing from the people that we serve, especially, and hearing from the advocates, um, and, and, you know, about what matters the most to them, social connectedness. Um, you know, having all of the opportunities, enjoying the rights and responsibilities of tenancy and, and, and communities of their choosing. I mean, those aren't just kind of, you know, lofty aspirations and theory for us. That, is, that was with Vicki's support and her kind of always sitting in my ear saying, we got to do more, we got to do more, and we got we to gotta get this done. And, that, and that's exactly the kind of advocate that you want to push the system as a payer to push the system, you know, across all populations um, to really, you know, live our practice of, of, of just having people not only transition out of institutions, but live their best lives out of institutions. Um, and so it really, I, you know, Vicki will be way too modest to say, you know, like it, you know, wasn't me, but it was, it was, it was really Vicki and her advocacy and, and what the Centers for Independent Living represent to health plans. Um, so it's, you know, that, that is really where, where it came. And it is all for us about empowerment and using our best practices and using what we know to create the service system that encompasses all of that and not just have the, you know, community life be part of our philosophy, but it's part of our practice. It's part of our payment structure. That's great. And it sounds like I'm hearing you say perseverance pays off and relationships are key. And it sounds like that's a recurring theme across the, the panel. Um, and so with that great introduction, Vicki, it's a good segue to you to share some of the highlights that, that your center, what you've done uh, as a center to empower individuals with disabilities, uh, transitioning from an institution um, and helping them remain in their communities. Oh, you're on mute, Vicki. <laughs> I, I shifted my uh, camera so I couldn't see my mute button. Um, so I, I think that centers for independent living are, are absolutely um, essential to uh, promoting community living. I mean, if, if um, I saw as people signed up for this, 
lots and lots of folks signed up for, as a center for independent living. And so we, uh, centers really are about moving people from an institutional setting into the community. So it's a, it's a natural fit. This is what we were created to do. Um, I think uh, that this settlement agreement does create an opportunity for centers to move into an area that we don't usually think about as transitioning from a facility given our history. Um, but uh, what, what we do mostly is that we listen to the, to the people um, who are making the move. I mean, literally moving from one place to the other. Um, and in uh, North Carolina, we call these individuals consumers. We don't call them clients. We don't call them uh, uh, patients. We call them consumers. They consume um, our services. Um, so one of the first things that we do when we get a referral from um, Alliance Health or other programs like them is that we sit down and we ask them, uh, the individuals, what do you wanna do in the community? So the goal is to help them retain their housing, but first we have to turn that house into a home. And so we've been working with a list of um, things that people do in the community uh, developed by Temple University, an individual named Mark Salser. Some of you have heard of him before, but these are about uh, 30 some activities that people do and that you do, that I do. Um, and we sit down and we talk with the uh, individual and we, we just work down the, the list. So, you know, we come to the first item and we ask them if, is that important to you? Is uh, going to the library important to you? And if they say no, then we move on to the next one. If they say yes, and we ask them, are you doing it? And are you doing it enough? And if it's something they want to do and they're not doing it enough, then that becomes our goal. And what this does is it creates a, co a connection for those individuals to the community. And out of that, they develop um, a whole list of resources and natural supports um, that uh, make them successful. So when you have that approach, um, and, uh, someone who's doing some look, uh, work on this, Mark Salser, um, can, can say that using this approach, three out of four people retain their housing as a result of finding them and connecting them to the community. If we don't do that, 50% of the people return to a facility at some point in time. And so this is really, uh, you know, demonstrates that finding that community, that connection, those natural supports is key to successful community living. Thanks, Vicki. It sounds like you have the, the perfect ingredients for retention uh, by using that Temple model, what you're still did. And, you know, I know people on this call today are going to be asking about the funding. That's always the big elephant in the room is funding. And so I'm actually going to turn this question to both Anne and Vicki. Uh, Anne, I wonder if you could just start us out with what, what are the different sources of funding out there, um, you know, that can be used to support this work, especially from your health plan as an example? So this is where the rubber hits the road um, and how do you pay for it? Uh, and for us, you know, for the people that we serve, uh, you know, it really is, you know, um, it, is, it is a variety of funding streams and, and funding sources. Um, certainly looking within Medicaid service definitions for those opportunities, not everybody wants to be in a Medicaid network, it changes your business model. So how can we have flexible funding um, for, you know, Vicki's group uh, who says, you know, like Medicaid's great, but I don't want to hire 10, you know, account specialists um, each month to reconcile my billing and then have you all live and buy what we authorize. Um, and I, you know, and so I think that there's opportunities state by state to look in block grant funding, to look in SAMHSA funding. You know, there's, I, I, this is, 
I, I think, you know, community inclusion, while it's always been a thing, it's becoming a thing. Um, and, and so we are always looking for partnerships and funding opportunities. And then those things within Medicaid and North Carolina has made some progress on um, incorporating some of this language in Medicaid um, service definitions. And, you know, and we still need to take it further because, you know, the first thing that you will see in how we authorize services is what's their level of functioning, what are their symptoms, not what are they, not all of those really important questions that Vicki just talked about. Um, we've also worked with Mark Salzer. He's developed a toolkit, especially for us and our work at um, Idle Transitions of Care. Um, and because we haven't figured out how to pay for everything that we want to pay for, um, you know, we've hired our own team um, of community inclusion specialists um, so that we can test out what are some of the interventions, what's the payment, what would, you know, when then you just move it into the world of Medicaid and everything has a rate. And um, but before we do that, we really just wanted to see. So how does this model need to evolve in doing it according to best practices? And then how, you know, how do we back into a payment structure? And we're still working on that. Yeah, and, and from our point of view, like any center out there um, or any other nonprofit organization is we, we're looking for funding sources all the time. So we fund a very um, similar program for helping people with disabilities move out of state prisons. Um, and again, using an individualized reentry plan based on the uh, activities that people want to do in the community. That's funded with DD Council money. But we also look for a lot of grants um, and we're constantly looking for uh, private foundation funding um, and as well as the board does fundraising. We are out there trying to raise more money in order to expand our work. That is great. And um, I have to tell you, too, that people on the chat are asking for that list of 30 activities from Temple. So uh, we will be uh, sending you all that at some point, hopefully with the uh, packet of resources after this call. So you all will have access to that. Is that available, um, Vicki and Anne and I, Marty? I actually saw somebody put a link in the uh, chat. Perfect. So it's already there. Perfect. Okay, so you all have that link in the chat. And so turning it over from funding now, um, Rue, I wanted to ask you, Anne, if you've been partnering with the public housing authorities in this work? Yes, boy, we could spend hours talking about access to housing inventory. Um, that was another kind of quick learning for us um, as a health plan that you know, as much as we stood behind community living, housing choice, community choice, um, you, know, you, you can't create that for people if you don't have access to housing. And even with federal protections, um, you know, the people that we serve are often discriminated or marginalized in, in, um, in housing. And we are not developers, we're not property managers, we're not landlords, we don't buy property. Um, that would never be a business that we're in. And so we went looking for partners where that is what they do. Um, and we have done, you know, several million dollars in capital investments. Um, but I think our most impactful work is what we have done with our local housing authorities, both in terms of, of creating access to the inventory that we want, as well as, as educating our housing authorities around the importance of um, of housing for people with disabilities. And so for our three major housing authorities in, in the region that we serve, we all have Olmstead agreements with them that outline our, our um, partnership agreement um, in terms of, of federal vouchers that they have exclusive to the people that we serve to date through those three housing authorities. We have over 170 vouchers exclusive to the people that we serve. So we can negotiate tenant selection plans. We can reduce barriers to accessing housing. Um, and you know, since it's a federal voucher, it honors our um, the importance that we place on scattered site housing. Um, and so people choose where they want to live. Now, yes, you know that landlord has to accept a voucher. We have a whole team that does nothing but landlord outreach and engagement and customer service. Um, we didn't start with that. We started with just knocking on the doors of housing authorities and saying, you know, I know this is kind of an un unusual relationship, but we would really like to talk to you about the about how we can um, be good partners. 
Um, and so out of this has grown uh, these relationships with housing authorities. And as a result of that, the number of specialized vouchers for people with disabilities that have come into our communities has over quadrupled. Um, we've had housing authorities who would never apply for vouchers for people with disabilities because they couldn't do the supportive services. And now that that's part of our partnership agreement, um, you know, on every round of HUD vouchers that they can for people with disabilities, they're they're partnering with us and applying for that. So we went from hardly any and on a, the same waiting section eight waiting list as everybody else to having these exclusive vouchers in just a few years with the importance of housing authorities adopting an Olmstead preference as part of their um, of their um, housing voucher plan. Um, so it was that symbolic victory, but it also literally created the Willy Wonka golden ticket um, that we can give to people who um, are are leaving wherever they're coming to and and um, and actually get to choose the housing that they want um, that is scattered site, which is really important to us. Thanks, Anna. And that thank you for detailing how you did that. It was one meeting at a time with one housing authority at a time to build those relationships and advocate and educate about the need. And so I we appreciate you doing that and increasing at least the access point to affordable, accessible housing for our, our community. Um, so that's wonderful. I'm going to turn it to the uh, hardest question of the day for this panel, okay? And that is, you have to only give one tip one tip to others about how they can replicate this work. And, and if you were going to give the one tip, what would it be? And I'm just going to turn over to whoever wants to answer first. <laughs> I'll start first. And okay. The, um, uh, two partners have been talking and um, really it's about trying to find the connection for these uh, partnerships. Um, now it's true here in North Carolina, the impetus was um, how do we uh, be successful, not just in meeting the terms of this settlement agreement, but sustaining long-term. The housing that Ann is just talking about will go will available long after the settlement agreement is over. And the same for Vicki and her work um, as the state takes uh, this work statewide. So for, uh, for me, I think it was finding these two partners, one with, with the formal, in the formal system, one who was investing in housing, one was investing in a choice of housing. Uh, and by the way, with great uh, support for tenancy rights, uh, home health, uh, personal care services, all that package that people uh, needed, uh, putting all of that together and then finding that missing piece. And uh, um, this, uh, I as, as Ann said, you can't say enough about the Center for Independent Living and how, how seriously they have taken uh, this step to find that one thing or more than one thing in, in some situations. And if we had time to hear Vicki's stories, it would amaze you about what has really happened for people in the community. Un unbelievable. Um, and I, I, as a reviewer, I get a chance to see their work. And I can tell you, that is real. Yes. Thanks, so I'd Marty. love to. I'd love to take my time to tell one story, if I might. Yes, we love it. Go so this, it. Is, this is the first person um, that uh, I heard about. I retired from Disability Rights North Carolina, which is the PNA in North Carolina, and uh, about two months later, I came here as to to be temporary while they were looking for a new executive director. Here I am, um, I'm still here. But the first story I heard about uh, using this uh, con connection to community inclusion involves a woman named Patty. Patty was uh, at the time in her late 40s, early 50s. She had never lived alone before. Um, she had always been uh, in a situation that was an abusive um, situation. There was a lot of substance abuse she was in and out of facilities. And when we first met with uh, Patty, um, we asked her uh, what she wanted to do. And she, she wanted to, to um, uh, uh, live in her house alone. 
Um, but she didn't want to be alone. She didn't, she didn't want to live with any people, she, but she, she was terrified to be alone. Um, so we started talking with her and we found out that she also had never had a pet. Um, and so she decided she wanted a dog. So we helped her uh, go through the process of, of, of finding where, and she wanted to rescue a dog too. That was really important to her. So we uh, looked up animal shelters, um, talked to her about what she would need in order to care for a dog. You would have to walk it, you'd have to feed it, you know, she, they'd have to get permission from her housing uh, provider. Um, so long story short, she got a dog um, and she learned how to take that dog for, she got a collar and a, and a leash and she started walking that dog. And the dog happened to be cute, which was a good thing and friendly. And so she kept running into people who had dogs and they were walking their dogs and then they'd meet up to walk their dogs together. And then they'd go to a park where the dogs could play. And then they started going out for coffee afterwards. Um, Patty is, uh, Patty who had never had a driver's license before, um, eventually went on to get her driver's license. We helped her uh, practice for the test. We told her how to sign up. She is now uh, going to church and um, on a regular basis connected to community and is out there in her community doing good works. Um, and that's Patty's story. And it was, uh, she wanted to live alone. She had a house, but she didn't know how to make it a home. And, and that's key. That's a great story, Vicki, and it shows the importance of actually listening to what the individual or the consumer wants as part of that transition. So, so thank you. Now we understand truly inclusion is not just sticking them in a house. It's, it's beyond that. And so, Anne, do you want to share your uh, tip for us before we segue to the questions sure, and answers? And that, that, that's a hard one to follow. So I got had a two quick things to say about it. And, you know, and, and that really is about, you know, being innovative, pushing the envelope, pushing the service system, pushing the way it's always been done. Um, and, and really thinking again, beyond the typical healthcare service delivery to what people want for themselves, what they deserve, what Olmstead um, has mandated and setting up your service system and your payment system for that. And a, just a quick story from a health plan perspective, um, about eight years ago when we really embarked on this for real, for real, for real, um, and um, all of that culminated into us um, deciding that as a health plan that we would no longer pay for mental health group homes. Um, that we created the community living options and the supportive services with the community inclusion toolkit that we wanted to begin giving everybody the opportunity to live their lives in the community without saying, you go here, you go there. And, um, and we had four gentlemen who had spent their entire lives, adult lives, living in the same group home. Um, they all said, yes, boy, this, this sounds like a way better life than the one that we have, you know, in a group home and nothing against group homes. We just yeah, you know, kind of to Vicki's point about asking people, we just never ask people, you know, is this where you still want to be? And would you like kind of another life for yourself? So we found um, them uh, four one bedrooms in the same apartment complex um, during COVID. And one of the gentlemen, by the time he transitioned, and for all of them, it was the first time that they signed their own lease um, in, in their whole lives. And for one of the gentlemen, he was in stage four kidney failure um, and his community inclusion process helped him plan his end of life. Um, and it was powerful to watch this group of people in the community that he had created, you know, outside of a group home with the people that he chose to accompany him um, through some difficult health decisions uh, that he wanted for himself, which included no longer having dialysis, which was not an option for him as long as he was in the group home. Um, and he eventually, of course, passed away. But his community inclusion team accompanied him through that whole journey. And so there's definitely kind of all of the stories of how people now have the opportunities to live their best lives and 
you know, and there's the power in community inclusion to, to give people the opportunity to make their own decisions um, without kind of formal systems, bureaucratic systems, uh, forcing a different decision upon them. And so we, we will never do housing without community inclusion. It, it comes in the same breath. Um, and there's a lot more work to be done, but for us, it really is about finding the great partners of Vicki, the wisdom of Marty, and, and, um, and all of our state partners to create a service system that is paid for to do this great work. Thank you, Ann. Wow, that was, that was definitely a powerhouse panel, wouldn't you all agree? And so we really appreciate your stories and your insight today. Now it's your opportunity as the audience to ask questions um, of the panelists. Um, I think Kim is still here as well. Uh, so I'm going to actually tap my colleague, Molly French, uh, who is serving as the HSRC director, to help um, field these questions and answers because I cannot, or questions I can uh, multitask technology. Molly, what's our first question? Thank you, Anne. Uh, Erica, there's been so many great questions. Um, thank you all for putting them in. One of the questions was for Vicki, um, but it, you know, if uh, Anne or, uh, Vic, or Marty have also responses, they could chime in and, and maybe even Kim, you might have an additional response. But it's um, going into the funding question a little bit. And Vicki, uh, there are a number of questions people asking just if your cell is using any Medicaid funding to support your community inclusion work. Uh, we haven't. We haven't to date. Um, we are getting our funding mostly through partnerships and grant opportunities. But we're trying to avoid a fee for service um, reimbursement because that. Um, that would actually change the dynamic of, of how we approach the work. I think I might, I wanted to add, um, since uh, particularly with uh, Kim on the phone here today, that uh, I believe that some of the initial funding uh, for the project uh, did come through a Medicaid, I mean, mental health block grant. Um, but the state has, um, you know, it's, it's very interesting when you, when you look at the success and the outcome Oh no, we lost Marty. Folks are getting the state. That's a benefit. Yeah, benefit. Okay, did anybody else have um, any responses to that question? Okay, if not, we'll turn to the next question. Molly, are there any others in the queue? There are quite a few. Um, one of the uh, participants asked if what can be done so states better leverage their existing um, networks of centers for independent living. Uh, uh, so this is Vicki, I'll, I'll, I'll take this on. Um, uh, I'm not sure I know the answer to that, um, but I think part of the answer, at least in North Carolina, is uh, early on, Centers for Independent Living really operated kind of as an entity unto our, ourselves. Um, so we didn't, uh, again, this is history. Um, there, we didn't look to partners like the DD Council, um, like, the managed care organizations in in the state, um, and I I think that this has to be a blended service. I mean, it would be great if we could find one big funder or get lots and lots of money to be able to <clears throat> do the work. But in North Carolina, we have a hundred counties, and our centers for independent living only cover half of them, and so centers for independent living, at least in some states, ours included are not covering um, all of the counties. And until we can get the appropriation up in Congress, that, that's always gonna create gaps. Um, so we have to get out there and talk about who we are and our successes. And, and uh, Vicki, isn't it true that the state is, is asking you to help other centers uh, get the yep. project off the ground? 
Yeah, right at the moment, um, there are, I think, six or seven L LME MCOs in the state. Um, Alliance Health is one. We're working with another one, uh, East Point, um, directly. Um, but the state is now interested in funding the, uh, giving money to the other uh, um, local management entities to expand this. But even when they do that, we still won't cover the whole state. Um, so it's a resource. Thank you, Vicki. And, um, and I'm curious, we have a lot of questions. Uh, Molly, where do you wanna go next? Yes, well, this is a great question we had early on for Kim. And um, just because employment can be a really integral part of that community inclusion. And so the participant was wondering what supports or assistance does SAMHSA make available to help people with employment? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, thank you for asking that. Um, I, I would say that uh, one of the greatest resources that we provide are the, the mental health block grants to every state and territory. Um, you know, states then kind of flexibly decide how they're going to distribute that funding based on the needs within their own state. Um, and so support employment is certainly um, one of those um, services, one of those key services that are are provided um, using block grant funds or using lot, you know, one of the nice things about mental health block grant funds too is that while it's it's a relatively small amount of the total funding of a state um, on their behavioral health or on their mental health um, services, um, it leverages, it's sort of like a key um, lever um, to pull down other funding. And so, um, you know, if you're interested in, in how um, sport employment is being funded in, in your state, I would encourage you to talk to your state behavioral health authority. Thank you, Kim. Um, next question, Molly. Yes, well, there were quite a bit in the chat and also some in the Q&A just relating to you know, the community inclusion only works if there's a place for somebody to move to that's affordable and accessible. <laughs> and so what have been some effective strategies that, um, you know, our panelists have found in terms of, you know, finding and securing that housing? I can start with that. We, um, um, at Alliance, we have over 1,400 people living in our supportive housing programs. Um, that's a lot of people. Um, a thousand of those are, um, are persons who um, are participating in the DOJ settlement. It is a struggle. I mean, it is a struggle. And there are many policy issues um, that, that um, create a hardship. And so for us, this is, this is where we placed a lot of our sweat equity. We knocked on the doors of the housing authorities with really nothing to offer except a promise that we would be good partners um, and that we would, um, we would offer supportive services, that we would have a point of contact at Alliance. And so if there was a tenancy issue that they would have somebody um, to call that would always call them back. Um, we created a landlord incentive program. Um, we do have a whole team. And I, when I say a whole team of people, it's three people. So, I mean, it's it, you know a whole team of three um, people who really focus on our landlord engagement and recruitment. We do, um, you know, and it's pretty competitive out there. There's the COCs that are also looking for, um, for affordable housing. And so for us, it, it, several years ago, it became apparent to us that we were gonna have to develop our own strategies to create access to inventory. And that was how we make capital investments into um, acquisition, rehab and tax credit development. We've done that. Um, and, and that's been a big payoff for us, as well as the partnerships with the housing authorities. Um, so my advice is if you're looking to start someplace, really start with your housing authorities. Um, they are often the largest landlords in your communities. Um, and to understand kind of the voucher system, to understand a quid pro quo, um, you know, it, it has, it, it took us a while. I mean, we knocked on a lot of doors before anybody said, sure, we'll talk to you. And I think it was mostly because we were pesky, um, but it has, it has more than paid off for us. Uh, to, to add 
to add to what Ann was saying, um, the um, state of North Carolina has also used home A11. Uh, they encourage the uh, application all across the state and help with applications for mainstream funding. They've been using National Housing Trust Fund uh, and and setting aside units in tax credit and bond properties for people with disabilities across disabilities. So this is not just uh, for individuals in the settlement, but but understanding that all people with disabilities uh, need affordable, safe housing, and they work very hard on on improving tenant selection so people aren't turned down as often, um, and making sure that they use reasonable accommodation. So they've gone a long way to have uh, to not just say, "Oh, for the settlement, we'll we'll pay out so much money," because they understand that it will end. And what we really need to do is have a really strong um, housing system. Um, and the rent issue today is a major. Across the country, uh, to get in. Thank you, Marty. And I think with that, I think we're going to have to segue to conclude this webinar today. But I have to tell you, you all had tons of questions and answers. Um, that is why HSRC is here, uh, because they're after this webinar is over, they're still there to provide information and assistance. I wanted to thank the panel. Um, you all have proven that you're definitely experts. You've shared some great advice in a short amount of time, and you stuck to your time. <laughs> So thank you as a facilitator. And I just, um, and you also showed us what inclusion was. Like the stories are so powerful and help. It's not just a house. It's it's supporting the person with the community and of people that, that um, are there for them. We all of us heard activities we can act on in the coming weeks. And I just want to remind you all that in the coming days, there's going to be the recording of this webinar is going to be posted and the slides are going to be located on the HSRC website. I know you all were asking about that. Uh, in the meantime, keep using the HSRC website, uh, which staff um, provided, I believe, in the chat. And then um, we're going to go ahead and go to the next slide about the upcoming HSRC webinar. So we have another fantastic webinar coming up. Um, it's next week. It's going to be on August 29th from 3 to 4 Eastern time. It's called Developing Partnerships Between Homelessness Systems, Continuum of Care, and the Disability Aging and Health Sectors. Say that three times fast. Uh, but they're going to be offering that uh, and highlighting opportunities for organizations and other service networks to collaborate uh, with each other to address homelessness. Um, and if you register for today's webinar, we'll send you the link tomorrow, or you can use the link that staff are actually putting in the chat. Okay, next slide. We also wanted to re recommend some other websites that might be useful to you in your efforts to support community integration, community inclusion. Um, staff are going to be putting these web links into the chat as well, and we'll also email them to you, so don't worry about having to remember these. One is the ACL uh, website for care transitions programs, which features innovation strategies and tools to help transition individuals um, from institutional settings. Settings. And for webinar participants who want to learn more about Centers for Independent Living, which we hope you do, we have a web page with background and more links that you'll find useful that's on this slide. And we also recommend our Empowering Advocacy web page where you can learn about programs that help individuals advocate to make these choices and ask for the supports and services they may need to achieve community living and full and integration and inclusion. And just one last note, our independent living program has background information about all the different types of independent living and rel uh, relevant programs available, even once in your area. And um, that's also on the slide as well. Next slide. 
So uh, we, this is the part where we asked you to evaluate us. Uh, we're going to ask each of you to please take just a couple minutes to answer our short feedback form. We kept it very short. Uh, staff is putting a link in the chat. There's only five questions asking you to rate different aspects of this webinar. If you have other comments, you can write them as well. Just know that we read all the comments and then we find ways to act on your input. So it's not going in a, a checkbox. Okay, next slide. So remember the HSRC is your resource center. It's, it's there for you. You can email us at hsrc at acl.hhs.gov about any technical assistance needs you have, website suggestions, or if you want to share stories that you have or examples of, of great cross-sector partnerships, we encourage you to do so. Next slide. Oh, and finally, I just want to thank um, Molly <laughs> and Mission Analytics, the whole team, uh, U.S. Aging, which Molly is part of, Jasmine, our ASL interpreter, and Herman Dell, our court specialist, for their roles in producing today's webinar. It was a lot of work, but it, it had a lot of information, so we're very thankful. And we want to, uh, we're especially grateful for you all for coming today, asking your, your really critical questions and being involved, and um, um, we hope you join us again in future webinars. Thank you and have a great afternoon all.